let's review a couple of key machine learning concepts. The first question is, what is the difference between a classification problem and a regression problem? Now, regression has a very sp specific meaning in statistics, and so I'm not referring to that meaning um, here, which you know refers to regression models like linear regression and logistic regression. In the machine learning context, a classification problem is simply any problem where the outcome variable is either binary or categorical, and a regression problem is simply any kind of model where the outcome variable is uh, a continuous number. I want you to think about what it means to be a rigid model versus a flexible model. I don't think we necessarily use those terms exactly, but a rigid model is one that um, tends to learn a very general representation. An example of a rigid model might be a uh, decision tree or a linear model, whereas a flexible model um, tries to learn you know, a curve or a non-linear relationship uh, in the data. And that can be a good thing when the data itself uh, has non-linear relationships in it. But as the word uh, implies, a flexible model can kind of contort itself to try to fit the data points such that it learns a representation of the data that doesn't generalize really well. And if you're still kind of confused about this, imagine that you've got a series of points and you've got you know, a handful of outliers on the very right side um, of your graph. And if you've got a rigid model, it's going to kind of ignore those outliers because those outliers, um, you know, aren't going to really make a big difference in how the rigid model sees the data. A flexible model, though, will try to learn the meaning of those outliers. And while that may be a good thing, many times outliers can kind of represent a fluke uh, or a mistake. And so a uh, Flexible model is at much higher danger of learning a representation of the data, which actually doesn't generalize very well when you give it new data, uh, because the outliers that were present in the training data, for example, might not be present in the test data, and you might have other outliers that weren't in the training data that show up in the test data, which kind of mess with the accuracy and performance of the flexible model. So we talked about some of the advantages and disadvantages a little bit. I alluded to them, but the just to state them explicitly, an advantage of the rigid model is that it learns a representation of the data which is likely to generalize well at the expense of not learning these nonlinear relationships. A flexible model can learn a very complicated relationship, but it often tends to overfit. And we'll talk about overfitting in just a second because it's a question that uh, related to one of the previous labs uh, that I didn't specifically call it that, but you'll see what I mean in just a moment. So what's the reason we split our data into a training set and a test set? The reason has to do with the fact that a flexible model learns potentially you know, a representation of data that doesn't generalize well. So you imagine you've got a series of points. A flexible model is learning a decision boundary by contorting itself and trying to learn every single point. But if you were to train such a model in all of the data and test its performance on the same data, you would think that that model is doing really well. However, the flexible model might not be doing very well because again, it didn't learn a very generalizable representation. So if you see that the model predicts much better on the training set versus the test set, um, this is an indicator that uh, this model is overfitting. So we actually call this overfitting. And if you think back to lab, the decision tree um, had pretty good performance on um, the question that we had in lab on the training set. And if you compared its performance on the training set against the test set, you know, it performed equally well almost in both sets. On the other hand, the K nearest neighbors model um, with the default settings uh, that were built into the KKNN package, 
the training set performance looked fantastic and it seemed to be much better than the performance of the decision tree. However, when you looked at the K nearest neighbors, neighbors model performance in the test set, it did a lot worse. So this gives you an inkling of an idea that if your model is doing a lot better on the training set than the test set, it might be overfitting and it's potentially not a good model uh, to use going forward because it's going to be biased in favor of observations that look like they came from your training set. Okay, I also want to review some key machine learning performance measures that I know were covered earlier in this class, but they are worth repeating. So if you've got this two by two uh, table, which is sometimes called a confusion matrix um, in machine learning or in epidemiology is called a two by two contingency table. This just highlights for a uh, categorical outcome variable or, a, or rather a binary outcome variable what your model thinks versus what is actually true. So A here stands for cases where your model predicted yes, for example, yes, they have hypertension. And the truth was also yes, as in yes, they had hypertension. D, if you go to the bottom right, is where your model predicts no and the truth is no. Um, and then B and C are two different situations where your model and the truth are not in agreement. So with the, this kind of two by two framework, I want you to think about when we ask about the accuracy of a machine learning model, what does that mean? And when we think of accuracy, what we're really thinking is, you know, the percentage of the time that the model got things right. So if you try to define that mathematically here, there's two ways to get things right. You can either have a model that guess is yes and the truth is yes or the model can guess no and the truth is no so the numerator here is a plus d the denominator is actually just everything it's a plus b plus c plus d because typically when we talk about accuracy we're talking about accuracy uh you know of the of you know of all of the predictions for example so the formula for accuracy here is just a plus d over a plus B plus C plus D. So if a model is 99% accurate, um, is it a good model? Maybe another way to think about that is, is it always a good model? And I don't just mean here, you know, can the model get a little bit better? Because I know a lot of your parents probably, you know, you got a 99% on your exam and they said well why didn't you get 100 percent of course you could do better that's not what i'm asking here i'm asking can you have a model that's 99.9 percent .9 accurate and yet it's worth just like throwing in the trash because it's worth nothing um and the answer is it's not necessarily a good model and here's why let's say you're trying to predict a condition that is only present in 0.0000001 percent of the population if you had a model that predicted everyone does not have that condition, it would miss every case of individuals who have that condition. So, because it's always predicting no. However, because uh, D is so large here, it predicts no, and no is so common in the truth that, you know, a model that always predicts no would be 99.9999999% accurate, for example. And so if I told you, hey, I've got a model that's only 99.9% .9 accurate, you would say, get that model out of here. I can do better by just guessing no for everyone. So just because you have a model that's 99.9% .9 accurate doesn't mean it's necessarily a good model. It might be a horrible model. The flip side is also true. You can have a model that's only 50% accurate um, and still it's a good model. Because for example, imagine that you've got a situation where you know something is um, fairly rare and it's guessing accurately only 50% of the time, but it's identifying all of the cases of that rare condition. You might be willing to tolerate 50% accuracy um, It's if you know it's able to get things right when it matters um, meaning like when they have that condition so just don't 
you know, uh, look at the number of accuracy and say, I'm happy. Always think critically about what that number means in context of how common that condition is. Now, you had a question on the uh, lab that asked you about recall, but it asked you this in a very indirect way. Recall is basically what percentage of the people who actually have the condition were you able to pick up? So obviously, if you want to minimize missing people um, through the use of your model, you want to maximize the recall. And I always think about the next handful of concepts by first thinking about the denominator and then thinking about the numerator. So the denominator for recall is everyone who has the condition or A plus C. Of that population, you want to maximize the percentage of people where you predict yes, that they've got the condition, which is A. And so recall you can think of as A over A plus C because you're trying to maximize the percentage of people that you pick up of the people who have the condition, which is the denominator A plus C. Precision is the concept of, um, which is also referred to as positive predictive value. Um, I should go back and say recall is also the same as sensitivity and also the same as um, true positive rate. Precision is the same as positive predictive value. And the idea behind precision is that of the people where you predict positive, you want to maximize the number of people who actually have that condition. So the denominator for precision is A plus B, or B as in boy. So of the people that you predict yes, you want to maximize A. And so the formula for precision is just A over A plus B. So where does precision matter? Um, the way to think about precision and recall are, imagine that you have a tornado warning go off and you're trying to decide, should I run for cover? If the warning goes off, but most of the time the warning goes off, there's no tornado. You would say that model has low precision. Um, and so it's almost like the boy who cried wolf. The boy cried wolf, cried wolf, there was no wolf. And so, uh, you know, people started to not believe the boy. And so similarly, if your model has low precision, when the model predicts yes, people just won't believe it. Um, because many of the times where it predicts yes, the answer is actually no. On the other hand, imagine that you're just walking around town and you see a tornado right in front of you and the alarm has not gone off yet. That's a model with low recall or low sensitivity because, um, you know, the, tr the truth is that there's a tornado happening, but your model predicted no because the uh, alarm hasn't gone off yet. And so, you know, if, you know, the alarm doesn't go off, that's a model with low recall. Um, so similar, you know, so as you're thinking about building these models, yes, you want to max maximize accuracy, but you also want to carefully understand what the precision means and what the recall means, because it'll have very different implications for how you can use that model. Negative predictive value is basically, in some sense, the opposite of precision. It's when you predict no, what is the chances that it's actually no? And so the denominator is C plus D and the numerator is D. So the formula is D over C plus D. And specificity is kind of like the opposite of sensitivity in that sensitivity was A over A plus C. Specificity is of the people who actually don't have the disease, what's the percentage that will predict no? And so it's D over B plus D. So I recognize that's confusing and pretty much no one I know ever gets this right on the first try. Uh, so take a careful look at this, try to work this out for yourself. And, you know, it's it, once you're able to understand it conceptually, it'll be easy for you to, you know, write this two by two grid and come up with these formulas by yourself.